We are also now recording uh, this session, so good to go. I hope you all have your teas and coffees ready by your side. And I'm just doing a little sound check. Um, can you hear the birds singing behind me or is it quite silent? Yes, we, yes, we can. Okay, okay, so this one I think is there's some dogs as well, so <laughs> <You know. laughs> bit of a jungle. Great. So we're going to shortly introduce our lovely co-hosts and just let you know, let you guys know where we are, how well, how are we doing today. We've been on these webinars for twelve months now, so it's good to also update what has been happening with the industry but also with the webinars and um, so I will just go ahead and and introduce first myself so I'm Anna Junnila uh, co-host and producer of the webinar we've been uh, introducing lots of different mice meetings and events properties from all over the world for the past um, yes actually it's been almost 13 months now and we always invite co-hosts uh, who we already have established uh, that the venues are excellent properties. So we like to, to highlight those, those locations for, for you guys and also just making sure that you know, we know where we are at, whether those properties are bookable. But today we're also talking about the industry in general. So it's the fireside chat about the state of the industry. And I would like to Firstly, also introduce my co-hosts, um, my regular co-host, uh, Sila Rikonen, uh, the MPI member and also the member of Helms Bisco. Uh, we are both representing the Scandinavian team. So welcome, Sheila. Thank you, Anna. My voice might be a little bit off key. I have been drinking a lot of hot tea as well. And today, if you will introduce our tea drinking colleague um, shortly, we like to drink, we like to drink a lot of tea. So I'm seated right here in the suburbs of Helsinki and conditions have changed uh, a few times this last few months. And we will discuss that in more detail. So this has been our over 12th month of visualizer visit. And we're so privileged to have our guests here from different hotels and venues that would like to present their services even during the pandemic and especially post pandemic. Definitely, and talking about the tea drinking colleagues. So today we are joined by Rakes Mathur, uh, who's really experienced both in journalism, but also event management. Uh, he's the ex-president of Free Press Association from London and also the CEO of Asia Ventures and has his own radio show in London. So welcome, Rakesh. Really lovely to have you here today. So what kind of tea are you drinking? It's still brewing and boiling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I, I heard. I heard. You know, the kettle go on, but now uh, I think maybe we're in the middle of exactly. You know, making sure that the tea is right. Rakes is uh, tuning in from London. Um, he also lives in a spectacular location, right next to one of our favorite venues, which is the the Institute of Engineering and Technology. So, um, and also the Tower Bridge. So his location where he tunes in um, is something that we would also like to do a, a, a site visit for because it's actually a venue as well. So Rakesh, could you tell us a little bit about um, where you are located in London and, and how are you today? Yeah, a little bit of housekeeping. First, we can unmute ourselves. Um, then we should be able to also uh, put in the chat our comments and any time during this live, uh, live stream, we are welcoming guests from all around the world and you may write your chat messages in English. So hi Rakesh. Hi. So are you recording it? Uh, I don't see many participants, so maybe later on people can run it. 
That's so, right. So we have participants tuning in as they wish. Sometimes they arrive a little bit later and we are recording this session. So it will be distributed to around uh, 3000 event professionals, but also when we post it on our channels, um, later on, our colleagues are able to, to view it. So, but for today, as we are recording the session, you know, we like to introduce ourselves. So those that maybe are looking at this months later, uh, you also know what we're talking about. So it's really about the state of the industry. And that's why I was just highlighting um, about your background, uh, how experienced also you are with the events industry, and also that you are located in a beautiful venue in London. So well, yeah, little... we were lucky that you came over and you saw it. Things have changed now because uh, the pandemic gave us uh, opportunity to refurbish it. So it looks beautiful, our great chamber. And um, already there are bookings for marriages there. But it's the rules which are changing now. From yesterday, there can be 30 people who can assemble indoors. And from 17th May, we can organize bigger events, but half of the capacity is still social distancing has to be maintained. So, but things will improve, I'm sure, in six months' time or seven months' time. So oh, yes. Could... We are looking forward to that. Yeah. And so... Tell a lot us of a events bit. are planned in London, uh, yes. so like Confex will be there in September, and there are other many other events. So uh, where I'm living is Charter House. It's a 900-year-old building. It started 900 years ago, but of course, every decade improvements were made, like last month, the improvements were made. And it was heavily bombed during the war, so um, half of it was had to be rebuilt, but built in the, rebuilt in this old style. So it's a historical place, place of much interest, but it's a residence place too. I'm, I'm among 40 other people who live here and there are 20 more private tenants and some staff members. So it's a big complex and um, it's about seven acres. I don't know how many in kilometers, half, half in how many meters it is. So, and uh, we have a lot of events here, our domestic events and the venues hired by the others. And it started as a religious organization, monastery, which was Carthusian monastery. But Henry VIII took it over and then it made it irreligious. It's not nothing to do with religion, though there is a chapel there. So in chapel, we have very good uh, intimate music concerts, which is uh, amazing. So we have sometimes we get choir also. But our main attraction is the main great hall. It has a capacity of 50 or so, but we have got events managers. So I have I can pass uh, details on your details on to him and he can send you or look at the website uh, of Charter House, the thecharterhouse.org. Actually, so I'm, as we are live here, I'm going to do it right now so we can get a glimpse of uh, Charter House, not Cannibal, <laughs> Charter. <laughs> the thecharterhouse.org. Uh, Let's see. Or you just uh, search for the Charter House it, London. I think it will. Ah, okay. It, it gave me the... It's okay, we will find Charter House just by putting the name yeah, here. Yeah, and events. If you look at the events and the bookings, then you'll see a lot of pictures of what happened. Like, uh, there was some perfume, Mike uh, Alexander, uh, was, there was a bit of, uh, perfume launch here, and a lot of film shootings took place, period films, because we have got the Tudor architecture, we have got the Victorian architecture. So there are different uh, parts of the British history which can be filmed here. So already the film, film bookings have are booked. I think film shootings will take place almost every month here. That's so, an exciting location then at the same time, I mean, talking about the COVID restrictions, so you said that 30, did you say 30 people can already uh, congregate together? I mean, that's... Yeah, at the moment, until 17th of May. So, wow. like Duke of Vin Vint, uh, Duke of Edinburgh, who died last week, Yes. His cremation, um, his um, you know, services will take place in Windsor, and that will be attended by only 30 members of the family, and not even Prime Minister will go there. Oh, yes, I mean, that's one of the sad incidences yeah. that for this week that we have heard. Also, I mean, he was 99 years old, um, so that's a respectable age, and uh, I mean, he had a good life, so, but it's really um, something different now when you can't have the whole uh, royal ceremony around it due to the restriction. Oh, yeah, and he was very good. I attended several of his events. Uh, one he did on interfaith in Windsor Castle. 
and he, he some of the buildings which were not in use he transferred the transformed them into venues and uh, people can hire palatial venues in windsor castle and of course uh, at the moment people can do bookings in the outdoor so outdoor there is you, know, you can have a lot of people outdoors uh, yes. up to 5000 people in uh, windsor castle grounds well that's so, what we were actually interested in talking about today is that um as the the events are going live and you're also in living in the middle of a venue that you know you will see that firsthand how things are improving that yeah. um what kind of restrictions do they have i mean for example for the entry to to charter house uh what people well, the have charter house you have to have booking because it's a because of its historical nature and it's a part of the royal property Yes. Uh, there are a lot of restrictions which are understandable so one has to book in advance and we have must have some idea about who the guests are going to be where there's a royal protocol to be followed and but the gardens are rented out as well we have got six gardens for the small meetings and cocktail parties and uh, and there are some very nice hotels nearby where people can stay uh, malmezo is just next door so uh, hopefully it will also open soon Yes. And uh, definitely. Yeah. Um well I mean it's there's a beautiful garden and uh, of course it's nice that there's a limited number of people uh viewing the places. So when it's uh, at its busiest how does it feel like you know living uh, upstairs and then seeing all the people around the gardens? Oh, it's amazing during the lockdown we had to take away food so i was sitting in the garden and next to the pond and and until last month there were daffodils and magnolia and now we have got wonderful tropical flowers uh, some japanese flowers also so it's always colorful here and they keep on changing the seasonal flowers here so it's yes. wonderful yeah yeah you've seen mean, it i have seen it i think it's absolutely beautiful and then you're just in the bustle and hustle of london when you walk out of the this historical medieval building so you know it's it's that contrast as well But then at the oh, same yeah, time you take a fresh air you breathe in fresh air as you come in and you don't see anybody for you know for, for dozens of feet as long as your eyes go so <laughs> it's very yes. good yeah, definitely it's... and i look forward to visiting again uh, now when the restrictions are lifting i mean we just read about uh, some of the the entry requirements because i'm actually in one of the locations right now that is it's a good example of what it takes to to go somewhere else i mean there's no recommendation to obviously travel at the moment but um i i'm taking a remote work stay so staycationing um are you in, in uh, where are you in uh, canary so I, i'm yes in canary islands in tenerife so yeah. for about a month and mm. you i had to take two covid tests within 48 hours so basically leaving from finland 48 hour test so to show in negative and then again to get to Canary Islands so that it stays within within that time period of 48 hours and then um, there's also registration so you need to really um, also go through a formal procedure with the country and the, with the Spanish mainland um, visitors were not allowed to to actually travel to Canary Islands uh, during Easter so it was only from specific countries in Europe um, so it is very restricted at the same time and yeah. in england too if you come here you have to be in quarantine for, for 10 days which is a e- drag exactly. but i think prince harry is uh, getting an exception he's having quarantine but not for 10 days really so oh. he will be able but, to attend his grandfather maybe he had his also if you're taking a test um and he is negative then you're not having to be guaranteed mm-hmm. that long so there are some exceptions i mean it just requires a lot of testing basically And, but uh, but, yeah. but again, the charter house. All of us have been vaccinated twice, so we ah. got two vaccinations already. But okay. uh, they say that there's there's a South of African variant which is coming now now to London, so this may not work. These two vaccinations, so we need to have a kind oh, of yes. buffer vaccination, third one, which will be in September. Yes. But uh, as far as the traveling is concerned, IATA mm-hmm. they are starting a, a pass. I think it will be launched this month later on next next week or something, and oh, it will yes. be IATA travel pass. And you give all your details of your vaccination or your testing, everything in that. So and it will be both electronic as well as part of your you know paper pass. So so IATA if you contact them they will give you more. But there will be proper launch, so they will announce all the facilities they are giving. 
And yes, it's already yes. honored by the by the airlines, Singapore Airlines, and all the Asian airlines at least, because in Vietnam there's hardly any case of. Uh, COVID. That's right. There are safer countries that I was looking at the list just now, uh, yeah. included Thailand, Singapore, China, mainland. Um, also, they had Australia, New Zealand, as we know. And in uh, in Europe, they are listing Iceland. Um, I know Finland is one of the four, I think, safer countries in basically in the bottom of the risk countries. Um, but however, depending on the country's internal policies, uh, whether they allow people to enter, that's a, another case. Because <laughs> for example, in, in Finland, we have a full restriction on travel that we shouldn't be moving from one city to another either. So just trying to, to get the cases to zero. So that's the goal right now this month. But uh, yeah, so what you talk about the COVID passports, this has been a controversial discussion. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the limiting freedom and all of these kind of things, because we don't know how fast everyone gets vaccinated. Uh, but we know that places like Dubai, um, you know, a lot of other cities like that, they have fully vaccinated everybody. So then having a vaccination passport creates this uh, unrest that people are like, wondering when they're gonna get the vaccination. So also my mom has got her first vaccination. I have no clue when I'm gonna get in <laughs> mine, but hopefully by May. And uh, let's see when the passports actually uh, start to be monitored, whether they are valid, because then there are a lot of fraud. Uh, yeah. But your mother is in the medical profession, so that's why. She, you know. Well, she she retired, so it's more oh, of it's her age. Different. Yes, her colleagues got vaccinated regardless of the age yeah. as well. So all of the uh, medical because staff. generally what happens if your medical profession in your family, you also get it because. Uh, oh well, yeah. I haven't. Here in that. this country, at least. <laughs> so well, the whole guess... family gets it. So it's advantage, you know, <laughs> working in the for the NHS here. Oh, they did it differently in Finland. Uh, some of my friends who are also physiotherapists or work in the industries where that they need to take care of uh, uh, people, um, they they didn't have the family vaccinated either. So I do agree with this. I think it should be because what's the point of one having and then the others being still exposed in the yeah. same household? So sounds good. Um, and that's why probably it's good that you also had in your whole um, building, everybody was vaccinated. And we also have loopholes, like at the end of the day, when the, all the vaccinations are left over, then yes. whosoever comes, regardless of age or because they have to get rid of the, you know, the all the vaccinations. So at the moment, there's so much supply, it's oversupply here. So the best thing is to go to the vaccination center at five o'clock and they close at half past five. And they left over it. They won't ask you the question of age and whatever it is, reasons. They will give you the vaccination. Nice. That's it. And then the loophole, which people don't know about. So yeah, I heard about this, I and mean, again, uh, my partner is from Netherlands. So some of his friends were telling this that that there is um there is this well chance of getting the leftovers. So, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard anyone speaking about it in Scandinavia. I'm sure it happens there too. Well, it, you know, we are all just waiting for our turns, yeah. basically. They don't advertise it. Otherwise, there will be long queues outside. So, uh, <laughs> but the only thing is, uh, it's locally. You know, if you are living in the, locally in that area, and you just go there, take your chance. And, and a lot of my friends got it. You know, here, and they are only 35 year old or something. Wow. So, well, yeah. let's see. You know, we. I might do that next time. I'll try if that is yeah. possible. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. But I don't know what uh, vaccination you have, but we have got oversupply because we have our own production, also Oxford one, which is much debated. At, so there's a lot of controversy about it too. So, yes, the AstraZeneca but, and versus the other ones. Yeah, the uh, French people said that anybody over 60 should not get it. And now they say anyone under 35 should not get this one. So <laughs> they can't make up their mind. So no, I think Britain has a better record than European Union as far as the vaccination is concerned. So, exactly, I heard some really good news from UK as well in terms of experimenting with events like Netherlands has done so far. Um, I think this is a good way of opening our industry as well that uh, people are giving these monitoring devices. So yeah. before they enter any event, um, they basically receive a little, I would say, tracker, and, and it will show where they move and who they meet. 
And then after the events, they are now testing um, contamination. So there was, for example, one event in Netherlands that they tested for 3000 people. And so far only five got infected. So the ratio that they were able to do. Yeah. And in contain, outdoor, you don't have yeah. minimum chances, minus, uh, minus zero, minus one chance to get it outdoor. That's exactly. why in England you don't have to wear mask outdoor. It's uh, but in Italy you have to wear mask outdoor, indoor, everywhere. Yeah. But, yes. Also yeah. in Spain and and here where I am, everybody has to wear masks when they are walking by the sea or whether they're on the beach or whether they're anywhere outdoors um, on the mountain. Even there's no people, they still have to wear it because otherwise there's a penalty. Uh, so no, it's uh, ridiculous because it doesn't. Travel, yeah. you know, it, it's had the gravitation thing, so the virus goes down exactly open air faster than, and then I, uh, yeah. I think it's a good, uh, hap, a good kind of way of maybe making sure that everybody remembers to wear it, even when it gets maybe riskier, like indoors. So maybe this is a way of custom, customize, like making people to to get into a routine. It could be. It's difficult to have conference with the mask on because you can't hear yeah. it. Even the microphone doesn't pick up sound properly. And if That's there are true. many foreigners in the room, so you can't understand each other. But <laughs> yeah, no, that is, a, that is a, one of the obstacles. Also, one thing is that it's actually relatively hard to breathe, especially when it's warmer weather um, yeah. with the mask on. I mean, colder weather, it's, it's nice. Like, I like in Finland when we have to wear masks um, when it's minus 10 or minus 20. It kind of warms your face as well. But then yeah. um, when it's warm, it's the opposite effect, sweating. Yeah, it's, well, if it's, you're, it's in India, price. there's a big problem because you sweat so much and the mask with the mask, it's very difficult. Oh, but and then it's not safe even because it's all, it's, yeah. So it's some of the countries like Peru and Brazil and India, it's the, it's the worst case of scenario at the moment. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Again, it's important to tailor the situation uh, to specific countries and have different types of masks as well. Like I have one mask for flying, which is completely different. I don't wear it every day, but it no, is a full on. Also. Yeah, exactly. It's full on. It has more space inside as well. So easier to breathe. Yeah, some people wear two masks and to be extra careful. <laughs> yes, I mean, I guess it depends on the quality of the first one. So then, yeah, but even the outdoor, uh, I don't know if you can have a marquee, will it be considered as outdoor or indoor if you have got a marquee? Fair enough. I mean, it's again the airflow. That's why a lot of the hotels had to change their air conditioning um, or venues had to change their air conditioning and the filters. Because, mm -hmm. you know, even if you have lots of doors and windows and they're all open, but yeah. if the air, air conditioning still keeps the air underneath the marquees, um, yeah. it wouldn't be as safe. Yeah, so they have to come out with some solution about it. So outdoor, because in in England you can organize things outdoor, but it rains so much here. Yeah. So <laughs> fair enough. So then it drops on you. Yeah. So under the umbrella, will it be indoor if you are talking to another person under an umbrella? I know you can keep social distance under an umbrella. But, so, yeah, that's you know, that's not the details safest. have to be discussed. You know. But the English are by and large they follow rules strictly. Yeah. So, yeah, not like Italians a, and Spaniards. That's why they have got rules about uh, wearing mask outdoor. Yeah, I think so. Exactly. That's how I felt as well. And in Germany, same thing. People wear um, masks. They're very particular about the 1.5 meter distance as well. Yeah. Uh, they tell you immediately if somebody's uh, violating the distance. So it is. It, it's. It feels safer when you're in a country where everybody follows the rules, though. But, um, yeah, but there was a joke about European Union. You know, the Germans uh, do what they are told to do, and the Italians do what they want to do, and, <laughs> and the English don't do anything except when they have things. <laughs> so. so those are yeah, cultural differences. Um, yes. In Finland, there is a huge talk about uh, limiting freedom. So even though we understand the reasons, but now it's more of a like, um, I would say, moral question, you know, do we have to? <laughs> um, so, Butler, have you noticed any changes in fin Finland with it's run by young people, young women especially? Mm -hmm. So how is it different from, because they say the countries which are run by women, they have been very good success stories, even fighting with the pandemics like Angela Merkel in Germany and New Zealand. Yes, and in New your Zealand. Country. 
yeah. Uh, well, definitely, I've been following closely for the New Zealand uh, being so successful with that. Well, um, I think we have a we have a controversy around this topic because um, yes, there's four 30 year old women, um, very capable and all of that. However, because they're also quite cautious, quite careful, um, I have uh, seen a lot of discussions where we would wish a bit more, I would say, direct and harsh decisions, uh, a bit more faster decisions, because there's, there's a lot of discussion around what should be done and it takes a long time to make decisions at the moment. Um, and then people don't really know what's going to happen. There is no clear communication on the steps, how we are going to manage the situation next month or are we going to open restaurants, for example, they've been closed all month, this month. Um, they, they were closed last month, basically. And then, uh, so uh, I think we need to look at this from, let's say, six months perspective backwards, because at the moment I can't really tell whether it's a good or bad thing and, and, and what to say to that one. So, because it's, it's hard to know whether they're making the right decisions when you're in the situation, you know, in the middle of it. Yeah, but here the restaurants are open yesterday, but only outdoor catering. So you mm. sit outside and you eat, and but again the social Ideal. distance. People is like to come closer when they are talking to you. Yes, so definitely. Outside. But yeah. I think that's a great idea, and that's what I hope that will happen. Also, that there's this gradual uh, opening procedures because we just went to full lockdown uh, a month ago, and um, there is no exception. So of course there are restaurants with huge outdoor spaces, or even Lapland, they are all outdoor. Um, you just you just it's almost like the a minus uh, 10 temperature or minus 20 temperature <laughs> in <Lapa. laughs> well it's been like that so for sure so i i think those places should be open for sure because you're just picking the coffee or your food from the little window and then you can just sit outside so why not i mean we like to sit outside even when it's cold because you know we are appropriately dressed with our winter gear so it's okay and especially when you go skiing and skating you know you're actually quite hot so you like to sit out there for a while uh, drinking hot cup of chocolate or coffee so let's see how it goes um i think we're definitely too strict at the moment there is a but they say, even in outdoor you know if you are out of breath and you are yeah. breathing very fast it can be dangerous you know it's yes. like you do rock climbing and then you go out of breath it can that's be dangerous correct. where you know you can give virus to each other in. Definitely. No, that, that's true. And they say that there's a seven meter spread uh, from a runner. So behind there's this funnel that is about seven meters long of possible virus um, cloud. So yes, I mean, it, it is different to athletes. And here they don't allow, like in Canary Islands, uh, people to do sports in groups, but you can jog uh, by the beach, but then everybody else has to wear masks. So. I guess um, this is really difficult to control what is the right way to do things. As mm -hmm. long, I think it's good that we do something for sure. About so, the hotel business, do you think all these hotels which have been taking part in your discussions, uh, but they have no idea when they are allowed to open? So. Uh, there are several that are opening and we are really delighted to hear also from, uh, as we talked to Leon and, and uh, you were there uh, last week. Yeah. Uh, that they have been open the whole time. So there are some yeah. properties that, that are oh, have been fortunate. Exactly. So they're, well, now they were four days a week, I think it was, that they were open. So not every day. So but here in England, it's for quarantine. You know, airports, uh, hotels, they are open for the people who want to have quarantine. So if yes. I go abroad and come back, I have to pay 1500 or 1700 pounds and I stay for one week. And so I don't want to travel. Exactly. That was one of the reasons when we were looking at uh, doing this remote stay for a month, uh, we were really carefully like checking where you don't have to do the quarantine if you have negative test results. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, UK is out of, out of that destination choice until, you know, you open that possibility of if you're showing negative results that could then just go out. You've got a nice out. terrace where you are staying. So it's, it's oh, lovely. yes. This is actually a local, yes, like a living complex. So there is a, it's like apartment buildings, but the mountains that we are rock climbing are right behind us as well. Uh, over oh, the yeah. 
Oh, that mountain, I can see it from Grand Canaria also, just across the sea. Yes, and, exactly. And there are okay. boat. Do you still have boats? You can go to go for island hopping. Yes, and um, it's interesting how they are being promoted. So the, it says COVID safe. Uh, it says actually in the sign. Uh, we haven't done that because again, I think those kind of activities do expose you to a possible risk of contamin contamination. So we are actually being quite isolated here. I mean, acting isol in an isolated manner. Because, I mean, as a visitor, I think we need to be very respectful towards the locals as well and not to put them in a risk by mingling too much around there. So uh, we haven't taken that, that cruise. It would be, yeah. So I, I, I do feel a little bit uncomfortable. Of... But it must be very cold. You can't swim in the med Mediterranean at the moment. <laughs> it's too cold. Uh, well, I think you can. I mean, coming from Finland, we do the polar bear club where we actually swim uh, during winter as well in the ice. So here, water is warm enough. So I, I would be, I would be swimming. But, um, but yes, cruising is another topic. This is uh, some of our industry friends have who have been on our webinars have also said how their business is suffering almost most out of everybody's because cruises have such a stigma at the moment. On um, uh, yeah, I remember safety. when pandemic started. You know, it started in a cruise. They were the, isolated. Yes, the diamond. The yeah, diamond, diamond the famous cruise. case. But yes. uh, luckily, only one person died, but he had some other ailment too. Uh, Definitely. There were 700, I think it was 740 cases on that uh, cruise. So that has infected um, the attitude uh, towards cruising anyway. So that, I think that will take a little longer to recover than hotels. Mm. But um, of course, there are new technology around. Uh, one of my friends in USA works for a robotics company and they have literally these robots going around spaces like venues and convention centers and airports spraying the disinfectant um, and continuously cleaning the areas. So these are also on cruise lines. So you can choose a cruise line or, or location that has higher hygienic levels. Hello, or you can have a room at the deck. Yes. Um, I put a few comments in our chat, meaning that um, if we could put on our video for our viewers in Facebook Live, uh, yes. say hello to your friends who are wanting to comment on your live stream. Um, first of all, yes, Anna is the host and she's able to allow all of us to be on the video with a click. So oh, do I have, oh, do I have that? Um, I thought we were all already on the live. Okay. Let and me so see where it is. That's actually a nicer view, Anna, than, than what you showed previously, which we- Oh, I was going to show a video of that one. We just got caught with the discussions. Yeah. Um, so I see that you're- Here you are. So yeah. you, you still have, all of you have uh, actually right to put your video on now okay. as well, if Ruckus would like to. But um, so the view that we were looking at was actually an example of the live event that is going ahead. Um, there's a lot of testing events where we were talking about the monitors that people are receiving before entering the event space. And then uh, the scientists are tracking the movement and seeing how many cases are possibly being extracted from that event just to, to make more scientific decisions on uh, how we are going about launching the live events. So 3,000 event, 3, persons event has now taken place in, in Holland uh, testing that. And one of the more exciting events that we're looking at now is Glastonbury after two cancellations is now going to host a global streaming. So they're doing the actual physical concert at the farm, but it's being streamed. So you can buy tickets from all over the world for different time slots. So that's a quite, quite exciting and innovative way of launching uh, music festivals back online. Yeah, but the Royal Opera House has been showing uh, operas throughout the pandemic. We have been watching it for five pounds, yeah, or 10 pounds. Or whatever. Exactly. Free, yeah. uh, exactly. So that's, I think, it's something that, you know, that keeps us all excited and entertained as well at the same time and culturally aware. Uh, artists are able to perform. Um, so there are ways around this as well. I, I think it's really good that people are using innovation and being really adamant of going live one way or the other. 
I truly agree with that, Anna. Um, as I remember Rakesh mentioning just now that it may be kind of like alienating some members of the global community if we start having those COVID passports uh, in order to travel. And perhaps the global meetings industry has a solution in place. And I think all of us uh, in the panel are very invigorated with what happened at the global meetings industry we just attended last week. Everyone um, is, at least in my session, there were 500 participants and everybody was very upbeat. So we could really have a good take on that uh, in terms of energy and enthusiasm. Oh, definitely. Uh, that's the thing. I mean, because we are quite used to now uh, just talking this way, um, we're also more perceptive and I think open for entertainment being streamed to us. So after a year, you know, I think we're less picky about how we are attending those hyper or hybrid events. The hybrid events are, I think, great way of opening gradually as well. So there are smaller numbers of people on site. MBI is doing the World Educational Congress in this manner as well. So 1,500 people on site and everybody else is streaming. So we're gradually opening, but then I'm looking at uh, the Chinese market and there are events which are for over 120,000 people or 160,000 people now being set for this year. Um, well, we'll see how it goes like, but on their website, there is no instructions uh, yet about COVID, but just about the live event as it's been. So I'm curious about uh, how, the, how the protocol will work, you know, to get to live event there as well. When it's yeah, such a huge ITB also just concluded in Berlin, ITB. It was a big success this year because they had more participants by streaming. Yeah, exactly. And there are very good debates uh, about it. It can be seen until the end of May, I think. ITB, all the proceedings and discussions. Oh, yes. Uh, also registered. I attended a few live sessions because there's been so many. Uh, ITB Asia as well ran just over a month ago. And then now yeah. we are having the IMX going on a stream uh, again. And then apparently I, uh, EIBTM, as in ITB, uh, sorry, um, our beloved event in Barcelona is also thinking of now having a limited number of hosted buyers on site and exhibitors and then streaming the rest of it. So let's see how, how our industry events are going ahead. I think we're also the ones that will lead the way because we will bring our knowledge into making it safer. Yeah, but it makes so much difference. I've been listening to a lot of music um, and it's funny, you know, looking at the screen and then last week I was in Easter services in a beautiful church, St. Bartholomew, which is the oldest parish church, 900 year old. Anyway, so there was a choir next to me. I was sitting, I made sure I was sitting next to the choir and there was a soprano, mezzo-soprano, baritone. Ah, it was so uplifting listening live and they knew it. Right? Because I was not more interested. I'm not Christian, so Easter doesn't mean anything to me. But I went there just to hear voices, beautiful voices, listening to Bach and Mozart. And, and it was so, such an uplifting experience, which you can never get from it, any screen, how large a screen it is, or how stereophonic sound system you have. Exactly. And, and again, smaller, more intimate events as such. I mean, they, they're also, they bring this, this elevated emotions and energy in the room as well, like you talked about. So maybe it's not so much about how big the event is, but just the fact that you can, you can do a live experience. To answer Rakish questions, there are actually uh, hosts that have attended our visualizer visit who are of course up and running. One of them is the Hilton Dubai cluster of properties our very own Sukoro, who had um, showed us three beautiful properties of Hilton, started to promote um, the expo already and has not stopped promoting it since. It's still happening in October 2020 in, in Dubai. And so, you know, you are welcome to see what uh, Hilton Expo package is actually consisting of. And I think it's really worth it to take a look in Visualizer, visit the properties before you visit the expo. Exactly, that's uh, one way of also getting acquainted with where you will be staying, the accommodation and all of the other details. And because we have the COVID details also in the venue presentations, uh, they're online 
links that you know you can also share with all the attendees uh it's easier to also i guess feel safer because you know that the hotel itself has taken consideration on the safety of all the guests and um all of the venues that we have presented have this very clearly communicated on their presentation and sometimes there is a tendency that um, technology can be expensive for event organizers. What do you think of that, Anna and Rakesh? Do you find that um, technology such as that involved in staging a hybrid event can sometimes be even more expensive than face-to-face? -face? Yeah, but it, it's getting cost-effective also. As there's more demand, there will be more, more manufacturing and more competition. So the cost is bound to come down. So, so I always, exactly. always believe optimistic about it. And it's a big playground. So there's a place for everything, the place for electronic gadgets, place for face-to-face -face meetings in a limited way, whatever it is. So if you have got a lot of choices, then the cost will come down, I'm sure. We have noticed this already with the technology that uh, we mobilized. Um, for example, I mean, Visualizer is free for venues and also for the meeting planners, uh, the technologies that we use for presenting virtual site visits. And also when we do the hybrid meetings, because there's more studios being built in venues that we talk to. Initially, I remember the prices being somewhere like 8,000 a, a, a day. And now you can get it for a couple thousand, uh, the studio space. Mm -hmm. So definitely the prices are coming down fast. Yes. And the telephones, okay. mobile phones are so effective nowadays. Like I am talking to you on my mobile phone and it's mm -hmm. as good as uh, having a professional equipment. You know, so. Yeah, so definitely. If we're and we are. Our, yeah, our hotel guests from last week, they presented um, a very, the very beautiful solutions from Intercontinental IHG in south of France. And most of their properties have a studio where you can live stream the events. And they are not just any, um, you know, off the, off the shelf studio. They're set up, they're well equipped, they have the right resources and talent. And so it's ready to go for your events live. And we have those uh, visualizer visit that can illustrate how the studio would work. And of course we can always invite the guests to come back and present to your clients those studios for hybrid events. And when talking about those studios as well, what's beneficial is that now the technician is on site um, Another feature that used to cost a lot when you're organizing uh, streaming for your event was that you needed to have the whole you know, staff around it or unless you're doing the Facebook or the mobile phone streaming only. But then uh, now, now they are also part of the venues, uh, I would say the regular staff or know-how that you, you receive because they are also upskilling themselves. So there's a lot of benefits uh, out of this digitalization, I would say, that we are going through right now. What I really find significant, Anna, is the degree of dynamism in the presentations of the hotels. Like in the summer last year, I saw that Hilton Pages does not have, you know, the brands that they work with. And the last presentation we had with Hilton had um, a lot of information and videos related to their partnerships during the hygienic protocol and COVID um, coping times. And so therefore I feel that it, with the same link that I give to my clients, I can already experience what's the latest in terms of hygienic protocol and social distancing updates just from the visualizer visit. And um, we don't need even our sales executive to you know, give us 45 minutes. We can just go to the link because they, they are updating it. So. Definitely, we had the insurance companies also being listed there that they work with. So, I mean, and I do like this uh, development in our industry that we are more proud of who we work with. And also in the, when we work with hotels, it's, it's, a, it's a compilation of different suppliers that we always bring in. So it's good to know also in that uh, search stage or you know in the qualifying stage who those partners are so that there is this very clear communication and yeah uh, yeah I like this kind of widening and more op being open to to telling us you know this is our group these are our partners and the companies around it. I agree it does give a measure of confidence and trust which we all need at these times don't you think so? Oh, definitely. It all starts from a knowledge of the proficiency and the ability of those that we work with, that they're well informed. 
And uh, I think, you know, it's been revelation also for us doing these webinars that we, we get to discuss, you know, with individuals who have gone through rigorous training and, and learning experiences about, and also testing different types of event setups. And um, yeah, so that we can also make educated decisions. But th talking about that, uh, I think it's great that we're also experimenting with live events in different formats so that we can all know that which way is ideal for us to then enjoy those live events. And um, with that in mind, Anna, I think you and I are working on an event for at least minimum face-to-face -face 200 people right here in Finland. So we can maybe walk through our audience in the future or soon on how we take these things uh, step by step. And also for the benefit of Rakesh and all their audience there, we have a calendar of ven venues and hosts for the hotels that will come and see us during the next few weeks. And I think very excitingly on Thursday, Anna, please let us know what's up for our guests next week, or rather this week, this Thursday. Yes, this week we are doing a, a site visit again. This time we are looking at the Scandinavian properties because well, we're leading up to having a host uh, the week later. So, um, so I would say that the, this week we talk more about the state of the industry and technologies that we have in use. And then next week we move on to having a French speaking um, session on the beautiful intercontinentals in France. And then we have uh, Janne Enberg from Clarion hosting a, a session for us just showing, you know, again, talking about hybrid events and, and how the hotel itself has equipped itself for, for the events that, I mean, the, I would say the current needs of event planners, that's what we're covering. And also we're giving updated information on regional um, openings. So that's one thing that you get each week is that you get to know how these hotels are opening. So we are actually now located in three uh, cities, world capitals, in fact. Um, of course, uh, Helsinki isn't quite yet in the League of World Capital, but London is. So to summarize, what is the situation right now in Helsinki, in Spain, and in London? Maybe I can start with Helsinki. Um, tomorrow, we will start our face-to-face -face learning in the secondary school. So my daughter is going to school tomorrow after maybe, was it four months of lockdown? And I think that uh, the government is lifting the restrictions on a number of places. Um, it's very political, so I'm not going to discuss that, but there will be more promises for the restaurants, the bars, and the hospitality industry to serve their clients. Excellent. That's really good news then. I mean, after four months, uh, your daughter must be excited <laughs> to get to see the teachers. <laughs> yeah. London yeah. schools opened last week and parents were delighted because it was quite demanding to have children around all the time, demanding children. So, <laughs> so it's such a relief for parents. It's a, it's a new life of a pandemic now. So, and, and that's quite good. And it's wonderful because we have got a couple of schools in near our property and it's great to see children playing in, in the grounds again. And then the, you know, the noise they make and it's so exhilarating. It's full of life now. It's uh, things are changing slowly in London, but it's a very optimistic uh, way. And our rate is going down, so that's quite good. It means from 17th, uh, from the June onwards, we'll have normal life. And we used to eat outside in the garden, and now we have got wonderful dining room. Have you seen it, Anna, our dining room? With oh, the I have. Yes, I mean, I do remember. I also remember some of your friends playing the board games uh, there, but, you know, the, the actual architecture of it, the feature of the ceiling and everything is gorgeous. Yeah, it's uh, Anglo Gothic. So, and we started eating together yesterday from yesterday onwards. And it's such a wonderful experience going back there, uh, eating under chandeliers and uh, being served, you know, with the three waiters coming and serving you. So, it's, it's a wonderful experience to eat out inside, indoor. It's, so, life is coming back, normal life, it's slowly, but it's nicely. And then you appreciate things now. That's the thing. I think our appreciation has definitely increased uh, throughout the situation. And um, now, I mean, smaller things also matter, like meeting, just meeting the people that we haven't been able to see for a long time. But we can't um, hug. I can't, won't be able to hug you, any of you. 
So. Exactly. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. I mean, it's just, um, I mean, how fortunate have you been before? Because we were able to. I mean, that's how it makes you feel, really. Um, so, I mean, what I'm looking at the, on the Spain, uh, I mean, they have a, the groups are still limited to four, uh, four people indoors and six people outdoors. So it's still very restricted. Um, the bars and cafes, they close at 11 in the evening in, in mainland, but actually in Tenerife, it's 10 o'clock. So everything closes at 10 o'clock. So then uh, you need to move indoors. And then also, um, I don't really know about the schools uh, at, the, at the moment, because again, I'm only doing a remote work stay. So I haven't really uh, talked to anyone about this. But I mean, the restrictions are very high because we know that in Spain and Italy, uh, both are high risk areas still in, in Europe. So, but yeah, in I was in of... trade show before the lockdown started. I was in Madrid for some trade show and it oh, was a were... scary situation at that time. So, luckily, I escaped from two places Venice and Madrid. <laughs> and then the oh. lockdown started a week later. So, but um, so I was um, in isolation for a week or so when I came back. So, ah, so you were there. Um, we actually happened to take the last flight from Croatia. Uh, before the lockdown so just just like I would have said that if we would have had that flight we probably would have stayed in Croatia for about a month and a half at least isolated um, mm. but then spent four months in Germany in complete isolation and lockdown so uh, so yes yeah, so but you were a nice place you you, had, you were bubbling with somebody you love and then you were by nature Dusseldorf with the Rhine River Yes, uh, yeah, definitely in the Ratingen area, it's all... And, and think of the people who were stuck in the one-room apartment and they could just go to the balcony. But they created a lot of things, the creative orchestras and, <laughs> and choir in the, from the, oh, their balconies, you know, with oh, the neighbors. Oh, that was beautiful to see. Like, you saw a lot of scenes yeah. like that, in, especially from Spain and Italy as well. Um, and I like the teddy bear, the teddy bear, uh, <laughs> this trend that everybody was putting their soft animals on the windows and messages and <laughs> oh, there's some remote, I mean, I guess there's some construction work there, but yes. Yeah, so and now you know the importance of communication is very important. <laughs> so uh, Yes. So yeah, I think we've become maybe more mi mindful, maybe more thoughtful, hopefully out of this experience. And the BBC were showing a lot of uh, travel programs. So though we are not able to travel, but looking at those programs, we realized that, oh, wonderful. We have been there, but we missed that. So next time mm -hmm. we'll make it up. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, now I have bought a lot of travel books. Uh, there's a writer called Jen Morris who has written about various cities, Venice, and it's amazing what she has written. So ah, would you like to write a, a travel book as well? Have you thought about? A writer, like yeah. Yeah, maybe we can, we can do that. Yeah, I have to find. I know a few writers here and there. There's a very good uh, writer of Indian origin, Piku Ayer, but he lives in Japan and he believes in minimalism. But he goes all over the world uh, writing travel books. So it's, mm. it's very good, but very meditative. His approach is different. It's more a spiritual quest. I wonder if they've been looking back on their travels and writing books in a, in a hindsight now when they haven't been able to to, to travel somewhere and or whether they have now maybe written more about their own location where they live. Yeah, and the other aspect which I find fascinating in Pico Ayer's writing is the inward journey. When you go outdoor, it helps you to look inside also. And during pandemic, you have taken a lot of inner journeys now. So when you go outside, how you look uh, outdoor situations, how do you see the location now when you feel you're enriched yourself inside? So, so these kind of spiritual things have emerged also, you know, from some of the books, some of the latest writings. So. Definitely, and sharing those kind of emotions, I mean, we we are noticing. I think we're more aware of uh, things around us and people around us as well, because life is not as fast-paced and moving to different destinations. But it it is interesting to notice how your location and how your movement influences on your thoughts, like you just said, uh, very heavily. Yeah, like the question you asked last time from uh, that guy who was presenting Marseille, you asked about the church. He said, oh, that's our church, Notre Dame, who is guarding mm -hmm. us in Marseille. You know, yeah. these are uh, important things. Huh? So. Definitely. I mean, 
and also, I mean, there are so many things that I've, I've noticed like on the same street where I live that I didn't necessarily pick up on because now when walking the same street almost every day, um, yeah. uh, pay more attention to it instead of thinking about the next destination where to travel. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, if you are able to go to Lanzarote, which is next door, not very far from you. Yeah. So you'll see that you believe in the spirituality because half of the island is full of lava. And the houses yeah. were made within lava structures, some of the architecture. There was Enric Mani, who was local architect. And you see, you know, uh, wonderful houses there, which are made in the caves of lavas, and how they utilized it, the nature's wrath into positivity. And they, I remember there's a restaurant, and they have conferences also in that. It's a tunnel made with the lava. <laughs> I actually, I have actually been there, but it was over 14 years ago um in, in that exact location you're talking about and yeah. uh, there are the lava stairs as well that you need to walk down before you get there and also the the plants i mean they are spectacular in that area with the flowers and uh, cactus flowers but oh, i mean yeah. now you do get this coming yes. from, uh, yeah. definitely you can like get the, the wine, same uh, wine and oranges coming from uh, mount Etna area they're unique you know the taste is so different <laughs> And you get it, red, red oranges, um, you know, with the red juice, oranges only in the Etna area and nowhere else in the world. So, ah, yes, these are, well, the territory, like the terrace or the scenery, it changes into almost like marsh-like yeah, territory. And if you think about, we are trying to it, inhabit yeah. marsh, where, yeah. well, we can practice here for sure. <laughs> I'm just yeah, going to comment yeah. how amazing Anna looks today in terms of her continents and uh, beauty. It's amazing that how much sunshine and good exercise can really do for us during these COVID times. And I noticed actually the trend um, in Espo, there is a hotel opening that's related to an office space with a hotel inside. And I think that's where actually the visualizer visit office is located. And it's amazing. It's it's like something to look forward to in the future. What's going to happen in this state of the industry, where most of us are going to be doing remote work, but at the same time, uh, we are welcoming um, face-to-face events. So, Anna, let me just congratulate you on your dynamic beauty today. It's amazing <laughs> the view and the sunshine. Uh, and may I suggest you should stay there for a few more weeks? That's oh, thank you so much for your kind words. I mean, it is, it's, it's exactly what you mentioned. In, internally, I do feel that as well, that the sun, um, change of scenery, I mean, it does make a big difference in your well-being, for sure. And like, this is why the travel, I mean, shouldn't take in, be taken so, you know, self-granted or so lightly because, yeah, it, it does bring you energy as well. And being fortunate, I do, I do appreciate the fact that, you know, not everybody can do this, but, um, but yes, summer is coming. It's around the corner. Luckily, everywhere we had some of the best summers in um, in Finland. Actually, now best summer months uh, last year, and hopefully, it's going to be the same. So, returning into sun, I hope. <laughs> and uh, but in uh, in UK as well. I mean, I hope that uh, summer will be similarly really, really warm. So. So. Today it's sunny, which is quite good. Uh, and I make sure that I walk in the sun along the river Thames, which is not far from us. But oh, I remember talking about nature. There's a very good hotel in uh, which belongs to the Virgin Hotel Group, and it's in uh, New Forest in England. And it's amazing. You come out of the hotel and you've got the horses running, eating a corn, and mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful. It's old castle which was built by some mine owner 150 years ago. It's converted into a luxury boutique hotel. So what's uh, checking these kind yeah. of places? Yeah. We look forward to have some of those beautiful destinations in Visualizer Visit Rakesh. Hopefully you are going to be available for us to show those beautiful sites that we haven't explored yet. We have a really big uh, portfolio in um, London and in the UK, as well as in yeah, Scotland. It's more than hotels. I look for the unusual venues, historical venues, and I'm lucky to live in one of them. But, uh, you know, it's always something different I look for. Maybe hotels one can find anywhere, but it's uh, unusual venues for meetings and conferences and how you connect with the nature. So that's important for me. 
completely agree on the unusual uh, aspects and also the storytelling because when you know that there's history behind it and uh, and also you can incorporate that to your events and let your well the delegates your attendees also enjoy that um, history uh, it's it is something you know completely different to the new and modern places but then I mean yeah. you have some like Zaha Hadid as we have explored those architectural wonders um, even the modern buildings can be giving you that yeah new- like Gary Frank Gary designed a Rioja hotel in um, Spain mainland so and that's amazing experience because he was inspired by boats and he's got a big museum outside Paris uh, which is amazing for a museum worth seeing anyway so uh, his hotels are and of course the hotel we stayed in you remember Zaha Hadid uh, oh Madrid. yes the what art Puerto de America or something no? yes Hotel America that's the one I did And, and we had he, adventure. We got stuck on top floor somewhere. We were <laughs> suspended from this on top floor. <laughs> But, yes, I mean, and every single floor looks completely different, and outside it looked different as well with the colors of the oh, building. Oh, it's a Jean Nouvel, yeah. So his architecture, but he didn't want to design each floor, so he gave chance to the world's best architects to design each floor. So I was mm. staying in Zaha Hadid. Um, but there were Norman Foster floor and other Renzo piano floor and things like that. You know, that was an amazing experience, and I always suggest people to go there. So those exactly. kind of venues I look for hotels, you know, unusual. Yeah. Yes, but, and we look forward to also uh, showcasing some of them, and hopefully together we can discuss. Uh, so we'll bring a visualizer, uh, 3D tour around these properties that we talked about uh, on uh, our later webinars, for sure. Yeah, It's we can invite hear. their events manager or somebody who can talk about their properties. Definitely, mm-hmm. definitely. I mean, it just gave a really good idea about that one. Um, mm-hmm. So we will approach and. Most uh, days it was, I think, Silken Hotels, Silken Group of Hotels that they belong to, but now they have sold it to somebody else, Puerto yeah. America. Yeah. We will track who, who the maybe in its NH or. Yeah, the name is the same, Puerto America. I asked about when I was in Madrid a few months ago. I asked them. But ah, so there. still. Well, that's a place to go to. Um, so that's a good travel tip as well for when the borders are opening. And um, yeah. so we return on that venue as well. And hopefully you will be joining our session when we represent it uh, together with the co-host from the from uh, from the hotel itself. And I mean, these are unusual venues for sure that uh, we like to to showcase some of the best known secrets. Is, Yeah. As we say. And the stories you connect. Uh, I remember when I was in Venice uh, last year, and uh, we went to the uh, Do- Doge's Palace, Doge's uh, Palace, Palazzo mm. Do- Doge. And then there in the museum, uh, we saw one section, Bassano, that he was making musical instruments. And I realized half of his members of the family were invited by King Henry VIII in the Tudor period to make uh, musical instruments for his court. So. Mm-hmm. So the connection with the charter house, and he was given place in charter house to stay and and create wow. those musical instruments. So the connection with the you know the palazzo, the most famous exactly. Venice museum, and our charter house was established. So those kind of stories are very interesting. Like I was talking about Venice, you know, the apart from Venice, the Virgin Hotel Group, which belonged to a mine owner, and yes. he wanted to make it as a Cordoba, you know, Spanish town of uh, Moorish architecture. Oh. Yes. So he recreated the hall uh, in the Cordoba Moorish style. So those kind of connections we can always explore in unusual venues. So exactly. I think delegates like look for these things. So okay, they need their comfort, they need their familiar furniture, and but <laughs> they also want to see something new as well. I, I think so too, and uh, to highlight those are and I, I do like the, they're also catering. To really bring the story out, you know, talking with the food, you can also talk about the the history behind the venue, and tell about the produce and the history uh, in that sense. So it's, I think it's. The Italians do, do that. Baglioni, Baglioni Hotel. Yes. They have got the Roman cuisine. Oh, that's fantastic! Italian. Definitely. Yeah. But you know this uh, chain, Baglioni. They have oh, always take the palazzo. There. Wonderful. Yes. I mean, we are returning on these properties again. So we're about Thanks. to run out of time for this one. I mean, the conversation is flowing interestingly. We are really like getting now excited about all these places that we should be visiting again yeah. or first time. Absolutely. And I, for sure, we'll pay more attention to the background stories and the, the connections there as well. 
So it was great that talking to fun. both of you. It's amazing and looking Thank forward so to keep, keeping in touch. <laughs> Definitely. Thank yes. you so much for joining us today. I mean, it was really a pleasant chat. And Bye, Sheila, also. So. Yeah. Thank you, Rekhi. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward Ciao. to learn more. Bye. Kitos. Bye -bye. Kitos. <laughs> okay, moi moi. Bye.